Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Deciphered right here on the CryptoCast Network. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much for joining us. We have an amazing show to talk to you guys about today. But before we do, we are screen sharing our website at CryptoCast.network, where you can find our YouTube channel, Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, and RSS feeds. And we actually have some merchandise on there if you guys want to check that out to support the channel. And again, we are sharing our QR code as this is a community supported YouTube channel. So we really support all the, uh, we really appreciate all the tips and the feedback that you guys give us. And there is actually going to be a conference over here in Las Vegas, Nevada, guys. Uh, really looking forward to this. This is going to be Tone Vase's conference. Uh, we have a lot of people coming. It's going to be a Bitcoin, not blockchain conference. It's going to be in Las Vegas, January 24th through 26th. Uh, we got a lot of great people coming there. We got, you know, of course, Tone Vase, the, the crew there. We got Safedine, Max Kaiser, Peter Todd, a lot of great people. So we're looking forward to that. You guys can check that out. And uh, I think there's only 44 tickets left at 0.1. And then, of course, Tone also has a VIP ticket. So guys, check that out. It's going to be really, really fun talking Bitcoin all all day long. So with that aside, uh, let's just introduce our, uh, stop the screen share here and introduce our amazing panelists and guests today on the show. Uh, Jameson and Elena joining us from Casa. How are you guys doing? Elena, how, we'll ask Elena first. How are you doing, Elena? Hi, hi, Vertex. I'm doing very well, especially being you, with, with you here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we love to have you. Yeah, we love to have you on the show. We love to have you here, Elena. I was talking Bitcoin. Of course, long storied history in Bitcoin. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that a little bit later. But let's also introduce Mr. Jameson Lop. Jameson, how you doing? Not bad. Just uh, trying to keep up with these nodes that we started shipping out and getting uh, feedback from the customers and making them even better. Yeah, man. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Really interesting stuff, guys. Um, but before we get too much into um, CASA, it's uh, before we get too much into uh, the node and other things like that into too many details, let's get some high level sort of questions going on before I ask you actually, before, before you guys, before I ask you guys what you individually do for the company, let me just ask uh, you guys individually one by one. Uh, we'll go with uh, Jameson first. What really is sort of um, the idea behind CASA? And really, like, I want to know uh, what, what drives the passion behind, behind you guys and the team. To, to create this product? Uh, I guess you could say that it's kind of a sovereign individual thesis. You know, we're trying to bring about the world that we believe is possible, where uh, we've always talked about Bitcoin enabling people to be their own bank, but we think that there's a big gap in the market uh, with the products and services that make it possible for you to do that without having to be a super nerd that spends days, weeks, years learning all of this stuff to do it yourself. So we, um, at least with our Vault product, we're trying to recreate a private banker relationship where we're helping people manage their wealth but the difference of course being that we don't actually have control over uh, anyone's wealth we're gonna help them manage their own wealth so it's, it's really about building uh, tools and services and great user experience to help us get to that next level of adoption Awesome. Really great to hear. Uh, and I, I'm excited to talk more to get into this, Jameson. Every time you start talking about it, man, I get excited. So let's let's let's, let's ask Elena here. Elena, what, what drove you to sort of join Casa? What do you see Casa as? I'd like to hear from your own words. Like, what do you what do you think Casa as? And again, same kind of question to you. What, what's driving your passion uh, to, to be behind this project? Um, besides uh, an amazing team, uh, first in, in, in the first place, uh, there's uh, also a big overlap in in the ideas on on where we should go, where where we could take uh, take this. Uh, when we met with Jeremy, uh, the CEO, for the first time, we kind of spent uh, some time over a coffee discussing the future as we envision, and we uh, basically uh, realized that we overlap in in pretty much most of it. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the work that I started with Trezor um, is great uh, because it kind of laid the, the base of private ownership of crypto. Uh, but um, moving forward in, in time and, you know, developments and adoption, uh, we also saw like a lot of new, uh, new problems. So we basically uh, tackled the uh, digital risk and, and the third party risk with, uh, with the Harper wallet. Uh, but then uh, we either have the extreme of being completely on, on your own with a hardware wallet, having to protect your recovery seed and having to eventually protect multiple recovery seeds if you decide to go into a multi-seed or being on the other scale where you just basically take and give away uh, access to your crypto to a custodian uh, company. So. And there was nothing in between and, you know, uh, even Bitcoin and crypto still being 
very early, I still consider Bitcoin very early, um, that where we see a lack of some, some customer uh, approach or some higher level, let's say, uh, customer services such as advisory, you know, uh, something that that could help people just just have and manage their crypto without fear, uh, without fearing of losing access, without fearing of you know compromising their seed, without fearing of what what happens if I die, stuff like that. So, um, and uh, as Jameson said, you know the the crypto of, of uh, private money uh, comes at uh, at some risk. Um, so we want to help people. Basically, we want to hold their hands on um, making it easier. Really great. Yeah. And I actually yeah. just tweeted something out about this this morning. You know, people, some, some people still don't seem to realize how early days we are. They're trying to look for the new Facebooks and the new Googles. And it's like, we're still kind of building out the fundamental protocols of, of the, we're still yeah. building out the rails, you know, like with lightning and, and uh, continuously optimized. Bitcoin as, as the base chain. So it's really interesting to see uh, how really early we are. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of, I think, opportunity uh, coming up. And, you know, it's it's very early days, as you say, as you, as you guys say, it's the difficulty in doing some some of these basic things. It gets really, really crazy with command line interfaces and, uh, you know, having to hold your own keys and things like that. So before we get to, uh, before we get more into Casa, I want to ask just quickly, um, just really briefly for both of you, uh, Jameson first, what is your role uh, in within this company? Uh, so I've you know brought over my like three years of experience from running infrastructure at BitGo. Um, so doing high level uh, management of the infrastructure and sort of general advising of all of the engineers who you know, this is their first time in crypto and they may not know some of the little gotchas under the hood when it comes to configuring things or using certain libraries or or just general. Uh, best practices and methodology for for building uh, crypto wallets. So um, I'm not doing as much uh, deep diving coding stuff these days. I'm more trying to uh, just uh, uh, let everyone else be a sponge and soak up all the stuff that I've learned over the past few years. Awesome. That's a, that's a great place to be in. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I know you did a lot of heavy handed work, you know, at, at Bitco, especially with the user activated software last year. There were some pretty awesome, of course, pictures that you were writing <laughs> uh, or that you were uh, tweeting out there about uh, writing some of that code. Uh, that was pretty great, especially, you know, when when um, when, when nobody was really um, when people were starting to get really worried about if Bitcoin was going to survive or not, you know, we had, you know, the, the people that were deep in Bitcoin, like yourself, uh, making sure, uh, writing the code, whatever it took. And of course, in your case, writing the code uh, to make sure that um, everything goes smoothly, smoothly with the user activated software, making sure that 2x doesn't destroy us. Right. So crazy stuff like that. So awesome work there, Jameson. So let me ask Elena this question here. Elena, tell me, t answer me this, Elena. Why is Casa better than a Trezor? Oh, it's super compatible. <laughs> um, it's it's not that it's better. Uh, it's it's a continuation for me. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm a business developer, and uh, I usually like to just pick up a project from zero to to one. And when it's successful and profitable, I'm like, okay, what's next? You know. So Casa is a very natural continuation. We are uh, still very close with Trezor. Um, and what I hope to bring to CASA is not just like the, the long-term vision, uh, but also some like, uh, let's say, business common sense and, and product development and uh, helping with, uh, you know, uh, partnerships, general partnerships and so on. So that's, that's what I'm working on. I'm very, very officially cool. I'm officially the head of strategy if you want it short. <laughs> head of strategy. Now of course, uh, no, of course that was a bit of a loaded question why is it better, right? Because you know, Casa is 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 different. It's for a different uh uh tier of, of cryptocurrency holder, right? It's more for people who hold a little bit more than maybe just a couple hundred dollars that they want to store on their treasure. Casa sort of um is is sort of helping people uh store larger amounts, is that right? Elena? Uh Yes, it's that's that's right today, uh, but uh, that's not the ultimate goal. Of course, we are focusing on we are basically offering a premium level service. Uh, it's imagine a white glove type of service for crypto wealthy, uh, if you will. Uh, but eventually, I would like to expand, you know, and, and offer the the features as we perfect them and, and as we as we are. Uh, uh, 
uh, basically building up the entire system to also open up uh, to uh, to let's say lower tiers in in the product management um, slang. Um, one of the steps that we want to you know we want everyone in the crypto space be secure and safe and self-confident and so having a to think what to do is not uh, not where crypto should go it should be everything like next button style um right um so eventually you know we will trickle down uh but right now we uh basically made another step we uh we launched a casa node and that's something that that's basically uh uh open to to anyone uh, for $300. So our premium level service, when I step back, uh, uh, is priced at $10,000 a year. And as you're right, uh, you have to have a certain amount of, crypt of crypto to justify that. Uh, but, you know, eventually I've seen this with Trezor as well, when we started and people will ask me, so, uh, how many, how many Bitcoins do I have to have in order to justify a purchase of, of a hardware wallet? And I said any amount because uh, in you know in few years your crypto may be worth ten times as much and I was wrong because it was way more. So um, uh, that that depends. Uh, you know the risk perception of everyone is different. Um, but yeah, you're right. Right now it's not just for small hold holdings. It's also interesting, I think, to look at this from a business standpoint, where a lot of the consumer wallets that are out there are free. And it's very, very difficult to compete in that space uh, because a lot of your competition is not uh, putting a price tag on their product. And what are they doing instead? Well, in at least some cases, they are selling data or doing advertising or basically doing some sort of surveillance on their users. And mm -hmm. we are kind of philosophically opposed to doing that really even to the point that we're um, being very conscientious about not putting any sort of um, standard developer debug logging and other types of tools that are helpful for us uh, because we don't want to accidentally surveil our users and have data leaks and, and, and run into, into the issues that we're seeing crop up uh, in a lot of large technology organizations these days. So from a business perspective, it, it does kind of make more sense to start out a uh, top tier because we can get a, a lot larger profit margin and then figure out how to compete more on the uh, smaller profit margin services later. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, we, we see some, so many of these large companies, not even tech companies, but tech companies too get hacked and have all their, their users' information leaked. And then, of course, we have, you know, social security numbers leaking like crazy uh, from the credit companies and, you know, uh, uh, crazy stuff. So it makes sense that um, people are... Uh, forward-thinking companies like you guys, especially in the crypto space, need to start thinking adversarially, right? More adversarially to, to not do these debugging procedures or create these honeypots that hackers can just come come along and, ta and take it. And now, another interesting point you guys made is that, so you are starting with a specific type of people, right? So I guess you could say the crypto wealthy, but that's because I believe we're, that's where you feel you guys can make the most impact right now. But the idea is to sort of trickle that technology down to uh, the average person in the future as well. Is that right? Anybody can take that. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard to sell security. Um, this was something that BitGo was good at. Well, and also even at BitGo, there was a learning lesson where when I first joined in uh, 2015, uh, we were actually trying to decide whether or not to also target the consumer market. And so BitGo had about a one year period where we were trying to onboard a lot of small uh, users and you know get a like 10 to 30 or 50 dollar a year um, service out of them and really what we found was that a it's very difficult to sell even a 10 20 dollar uh, service because most of the others are free and b you end up having a huge overhead uh, you know with customer support and and ending up having to do a lot of of hand holding and basic user education so i am you know, as much as people hate on services like uh, blockchain.info and Coinbase and uh, and various large uh, providers, I, I think that they are providing some interesting services, at least along the user education front, where uh, they're essentially subsidizing a lot of the, the onboarding and customer education for, for new entrants into the system. But... Um, 
just from a like ability to sell security to people standpoint, it's a lot easier to sell security to someone who has a lot more to lose. And so that's another reason why um, it makes sense to target the, the folks who have millions of, of dollars worth of crypto that is, um, in many cases, we found causing them you know, to have issues even sleeping at night. And so really what we're selling is peace of mind. And we found a number of users, once they've gotten onboarded with us, have essentially told us that they they have much greater peace of mind and they're not worried about you know some catastrophe happening that causes them to get completely wiped out. Yep, that makes great. That makes a lot of sense. Great points, Jameson, on that. You know, we you have to serve the people that need it the most, and of course, people with the largest amounts are going to be the ones that tend to need that the most right now. So let me ask you this then, uh, Jameson: Why should we trust Casa? Well, yeah, you shouldn't. Um, we're we're going to be making some uh, posts. I'm going to ask you too, Elena, after Jameson. I'm going to ask you too, but let's get Jameson's comment first. Sorry. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, so uh, we haven't said anything about it yet, but we're currently working on formalizing our open source policy and, uh, and deciding you know, which parts of our infrastructure get open source so that people can have better peace of mind of the, the security of the code itself. But um, ultimately, at least for the Vault product, um, the fact that we're actually building on top of these other hardware uh, key management device platforms is uh, very interesting uh, from a kind of like separation of, um, of ability and, and partitioning, I guess, of the security of the system. Because what it means is that even if, um, if CASA and our code or our database um, got compromised in a way that it tried to get you to create a transaction that went to an address that didn't belong to you, uh, you would still have to manually verify that that address is going to uh, receive some amount of value. And you have to verify that on multiple different hardware uh, devices and platforms that CASA has no control over. So that's kind of like the ultimate stopgap of CASA doing anything particularly ma malevolent. Um, and of course, I, I didn't even talk about the the like theft of private keys. That's that's actually a complete non-issue because we only have one out of the five keys. Um, all of the other keys are on completely separate hardware. So really like the the biggest threat or attack vector for the multi-sig vault product is um, bad data or bad code somehow getting out onto our servers and, and causing uh, transactions to be formed in a malicious way. But like I said, you have to then, you would have to be completely not paying attention to anything and have to confirm multiple times on different devices. So. Uh, that provides a, a level of security that you don't really see even in other multi-sig products. Very, very interesting. So you guys only keep one of the keys then. Uh, you guys don't keep, you know, for example, every single key. So uh, then let's ask Elena then. So Elena, what, what, why should, um, you know, the average, you know, crypto wealthy person trust Casa? What, what, what would they uh, use? Uh, what would they trust in Casa over a Trezor? Uh, th th this is this is not about like tr trusting Trezor versus trusting Casa because our clients are basically all of them are using both uh, a Trezor wallet and a Ledger. Uh, uh, some of them multiple uh, and Casa uh, Casa is only one key of the five. So as that Jameson already explained, um, so it's more a um, you know the entire setup as it's done plus uh, our internal policies about protecting uh, user data we are very uh, uh, careful about not even sharing uh, uh, customer names within the company and stuff like that so we have we have really policies internally uh, to protect our customers uh, I don't want to give more details because uh, why uh, <laughs> we don't want to expose all the security we, element, but we, <laughs> exactly exactly uh, and we don't want to teach our competitors and that may um, you know, um, but uh, but this is basically you know what what, what Jameson was explaining, and the entire multi sig setup does not allow us to move the the money. Um, and besides, we basically provide uh, uh, dedicated uh, client service uh, to each of our customers. 
where you know uh, they know each other, they they've seen each other face to face. So there's an additional, basically, hand holding. But uh, that's that's it. No Bitcoin holding on on Casa side. It's very very cool. So let me ask Jameson this, uh, Jameson. What happens if the Casa servers get blown up? Yeah, so we have outlined a uh, what we call sovereign recovery process where when you initialize your Casa wallet, we send you basically the public key data that's associated with, with all five of those keys. And when you have that pub key data and you know a few other attributes about the wallet itself, you can then use that to recreate the wallet using other open source software that is compliant with the various Bitcoin improvement proposals out there. And as long as you then have your hardware uh, devices, you can plug them in and uh, do the actual signing to create a transaction. So it, it's, um, you know, a lot more manual process and uh, not nearly as user friendly as using the, the Casa software itself, but we have a, a proof of concept that you can go and we actually encourage our users to test uh, as part of their onboarding process to show that you know nothing that we're doing is fully reliant upon Casa as a single uh, central server. Um, if anything, our server is only really there to help facilitate um, you know the the. Um, the partially signed Bitcoin transactions. And we even have uh, on our longer term roadmap, various plans to move more and more of that facilitation uh, and queries and stuff off of our server and to things such as your at home node device. So this is all you know, part of a very long term roadmap to make the user as sovereign as possible and, and just make us be a software service provider that doesn't have the ability to, to block anything or you know, censor anything or steal anything, uh, even if we uh, went rogue or disappeared off the face of the planet. Awesome, yeah. that, sounds, that sounds good. Uh, Lena, do you wanna elaborate? Yeah, yeah, CASA also may, uh, makes steps towards where uh, our clients don't have to trust themselves so much either. So <laughs> by, by that, I want to say um, we came up with something um, that's called seedless setup. Um, and that basically is a, a protection against human creativity uh, or for forgetfulness or for, you know, against some criminal minds. Uh, because we came up with a, a multi-sig setup where basically we, we did completely away with the recovery seat with those 24 words. Uh, our clients do not store them um, and that um, makes them, uh, in my opinion, more secure. Uh, because you know, having uh, uh, four uh, keys to protect or five keys to protect and five different recovery seeds actually increases your risk exposure. So um, that that doesn't work. You know, the traditional way of setting up a multi-sig on your own and then ending up with these ten items that you need to protect and you need to know, you know, on top of that five pins or maybe even passphrases. So that it's a bunch of uh, uh, data and a bunch of items to protect all of a sudden. So uh, the, the way for us was to completely get rid of the recovery seat. And that I think brings a huge peace of mind to, to a lot of users because before that, even during my uh, CEOing of Trezor, people would ask this a lot, like, what do I do with the recovery seat? What if my house burns down? Should I copy it? Should I divide it? You know, <laughs> what should I do with it? It's a completely new uh, paradigm for people to all of a sudden, all their wealth depends on a piece of paper. Uh, so there's that, you know, uh, so you don't have to trust yourself anymore that uh, you've stored it well and nobody's going to steal it from you. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. See, it sounds like so. It really sounds like you guys are trying to merge sort of this this usability of a of a mobile app, some sim simplicity of something that people are familiar with, with kind of like uh, the infrastructure of what we used to come to expect to maybe of a bank, right? So, of a, but of course, in that in the previous scenario, the bank had all the power and everything like that. There was of course no mm -hmm. self self sovereignty at all. But with you guys, it seems that since you guys only hold one key, uh, then you're it's trying to combine the best of both worlds, trying to make sure that you have this cold storage option but that it's secure and that it's easy to use at the same time. So speaking of that, Elena, maybe you can walk us through um, 
sort of the onboarding process. Because as you say, like the biggest risk to the user, right, is themselves. And I think you guys are trying to eliminate as much as possible it, it, without actually eliminating the user itself <laughs> as much as you can <laughs> before we eliminate the user. So maybe you can just quickly walk us through uh, an, an onboarding process uh, with Casa. Yeah, uh, what you what you mentioned about the user experience, the usability is a, is a key component to everything we do. Uh, so you have you know the security of hardware wallets uh, and the multi sig and the multi device multi location setup, but you have the actual usability of Tinder. Um, I don't know, uh, raise your hands, whoever's using Tinder. <laughs> but you know, there's this uh, swipe left and right and the super like, and we are extremely uh, uh, lucky to have the, the actual designer of Tinder on our team as a, as a lead designer. So uh, as you see, and this guy, uh, Scott Herf is his name, he, uh, he is the the god of everything that gets out to the to the public. So he uh, uh, is on top of the chain. He doesn't have experience with Bitcoin, which is amazing, because he uh, quickly sees any weirdness, you know, in the process and anything that may come up is not really user friendly. Um, so there's that, you know, the user centric uh, design uh, is is really important uh, component of CASA and what we're trying to achieve. And so the onboarding basically uh, happens face to face uh, with with a dedicated client advisor who uh, sets you up with your hardware wallets, uh, who sets you up with the application, explains how it works. And then we have a procedure uh, where the client is testing everything. We uh, we play with testnet coins first, you know, we do some disaster recoveries, stuff like that until uh, the client is completely uh, comfortable uh, with onboarding his entire crypto wealth. And that's basically uh, the, for the beginning. Then we continue to to be there uh, available 24-7 uh, on call. You know, you wake up at night and you realize you don't have your treasure. So who do you call? <laughs> you call your, your, your Ghostbuster from Casa, right? <laughs> So um, that that's there. Uh, we uh, try to uh, educate our customers a little bit on on the security, but mainly keep up to date with what's going on and what's relevant to them uh, in the market. Jameson, maybe you could uh, tell about your uh, Faraday bag and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, we like to also play we and to to bring things into perfection. And Jameson has a perfect dome for that, I think. Yeah, so, you know, the actual technical steps of onboarding uh, is really fast. Uh, I think the, the the part of onboarding that takes the longest is if you're using a ledger and um, it still forces you to write down those uh, seed phrase so that you can yeah. confirm it before you continue. But then, of course, we tell them to destroy the seed phrase that they temporarily wrote down. Uh, Trezor is streamlining that with the, the seedless option. Um, but, but the actual process of getting your wallet set up is pretty much as simple as uh, we, we create an account for your whatever email address you want. You set the password. Uh, you, you you download the mobile app and then log in, start walking through the process. And it's basically, you know, uh, we, we generate a private key uh, on the mobile device. We then uh, suck up the uh, extended public keys off of your three different uh, hardware devices. And each one of those steps only takes a matter of seconds. Um, and, uh, and, and then once you've got... Uh, that last uh, hardware public key, then everything is uh, ready to go and you can uh, set up, uh, well, we automatically have a, a testnet account that's created and you know we'll send you some testnet coins and then you can start playing around with creating transactions uh, or with rotating keys or with doing the, uh, the sovereign recovery process, uh, just uh, getting completely familiar with uh, all of the, the available options in the product. Uh, but as Elena was saying, um, we have gotten rid of the need to figure out how to securely store the seed phrases. And um, now, instead, 
I think it's easier for humans to visualize uh, just having you know these three different devices and and keeping them safe. And so the only thing we really need to worry about there, uh, we don't need to worry about uh, like physical theft or access of any single device because they're being kept geographically separated and they're pin protected. Um, we really more have to worry about keeping them safe from natural events happening, you know, whether it's a fire or like an electromagnetic pulse or, or what have you. And so uh, we also have uh, as one of our little uh, products that is available is a, a CASA branded EMP proof bag that's the perfect size for your treasure ledger, what have you. Um, you know, we've also talked about uh, maybe potentially fireproof bags and stuff like that, but I uh, haven't settled on anything yet. But it's this is kind of part of the service offering is that CASA has experts who are thinking about all of these crazy edge cases so that you don't have to. And all you have to do is you know follow the instructions that we're telling you, follow the instructions that are on the mobile device, the mobile app, and uh, and you'll have a level of security that's arguably even greater than anything that you'll get at a single bank. Yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. You know, I, I like the point, Jameson, where, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you. I've been in the space almost as long as you, Jameson. And I'm, you know, I remember the days when we were talking about, we wanted everybody to be their own bank, right? Like I, this was, this was the goal. But of course, as, as for the viewers listening to this and, and, you know, the audio listeners, you can sort of, sort of grasp how difficult it actually is to be your own bank. Like it's really not as easy as we wanted. And, and it's going to get, it's going to actually continue to evolve and to get easier. Uh, thanks to companies like Casa that is thinking about uh, processes to make it easier and, and, and providing service to do, to do that. But we're just not there yet. It's very, very early days. Again, with the com we're command line mm -hmm. interfaces, you know, it's 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 very difficult to use. Uh, I actually tweeted out a picture of an old modem where you had to actually put the phone on the modem uh, and have it dial out. It's it's pretty crazy, you know, trying to have people uh, uh, buy, go out and buy a modem, configure it to their ISP, and then download software to make that work after that. And, it, you know, it, that's where we are right now. And so I think uh, services like this are going to help us get to where uh, we need to be with, with people being able to hold sovereignty over their own funds, you know, as opposed to the previous solution, which of course was 100% trust uh, in a third party like a bank. Now, you guys, you guys are are kind of um, pioneering this 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 best in class key store with this this really great customer service of like being able to handhold people through the whole process. But let me ask you this, Jameson: uh, What happens if I lose all my keys and all my devices that you give me? What happens, James? Yeah, so you know, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is find the balance between uh, sovereignty, security, um, and uh, responsibility. And you know, this is arguably one of the reasons why a lot of people like banks. It's because banks uh, have experts that are thinking about all of these edge cases, and uh, you know, that's basically what they uh, get paid to do. Um, and and really from an even higher level, like this is how society has evolved, right? Is a specialization of tasks. It's like nobody out there is humanly able to be an expert in everything. And in order for us to be more efficient and more productive and able to do something really well and get compensated for it, is that uh, we, we delegate responsibility for certain things to other providers and we're willing to pay them uh, you know, some certain amount of, of resources for that. So, you know, ultimately, everything that we've done at CASA is uh, it's possible for anyone else to do themselves if they have the technical expertise, if they have the time, uh, if they're willing to, to scale the steep learning curve that is required, which, you know, is arguably months or years of, of, of deep experience in this field. So, um, because we are a company that is focused on users being more sovereign and, and us as a company not having control over the user's funds, it ultimately means that uh, if the user screws up enough, then it's game over. So um, we, we try to strike the right balance when we were thinking of like the multi-sig setup um, and you know, combining it with hardware devices and combining it with you know, having geographically separated uh, key material that um, if you lose a device uh, when you have a CASA wallet, it's actually extremely simple to recover from that. 
You just you can go buy your own device off of any website or store if there is a, uh, a cypherpunk store available near you, or you can call us and we'll overnight one to you. And all you have to do, you don't even have to call us up on the phone uh, to, to do a key rotation. It's actually built into the mobile application itself. You go into the app, you click on that device and the key shield, and you say, I need to replace this. And then we walk you through a very simple uh, setup where, once again, we, we suck the extended public key off of that device. And we then uh, walk you through creating a transaction that sweeps your, your old wallet and, and basically sends all of the value to your new wallet, which is the same. Uh, four out of the five uh, you know, key sets are the same. But uh, just doing that all in a very seamless process so that uh, the user can then once again see their key shield uh, uh, and have it you know, show that you know, everything is all right. Now, if you lose two devices at the same time before you can replace one of them, which you know, I guess could happen, um, uh, especially if you don't have your keys uh, you know, geographically separated far enough and there's some sort of major disaster, uh, then at that point you are going to have to call up CASA. And that is when the key uh, that we are holding comes into play. So basically uh, you will uh, have to go into the recovery mode to, to sign a recovery transaction where uh, you're getting your remaining two devices and then asking CASA to co-sign the, uh, the third set of keys. And of course, we are not going to do that in an automated fashion. We're going to require strong uh, like voice and face uh, identification. And, uh, and actually, this is also where the end of life uh, scenarios uh, come into play, where um, if, if you have passed and your family needs to get access and they don't have enough devices to sign a transaction themselves, then they might come to us, you know, bringing various legal documents, you know, death certificate, et cetera, et cetera. And at that case, CASA would also uh, co-sign to release the funds. So that, of course, is the, the boundary condition. Uh, if you lose three devices at the exact same time and you're not paying attention or for whatever reason you were keeping them all in your house and it burned down, then it's game over and uh, unfortunately you didn't follow instructions and you have to suffer the consequences. And this is, of course, the, the trade-off that anyone in the system is making is that in order to have more power over your own assets, you have to be willing to take the responsibility for them. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, this is this is this is what this is what personal individual sovereignty means. It means taking personal responsibility. So, uh, very very good points, Jameson. Uh, let me ask you, Elena. Um, you, you know, it's 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 funny because you know a lot a lot of these a lot of people don't understand the traditional financial system about uh, how many layers deep it is, just built after century, you know, decade after decade of trust and all of this craziness. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that um. It gets so complex that even with Bitcoin, people that all the people that I've known about Bitcoin really ha didn't start investing until like a year or two after they started learning about it because this stuff is so complex. So um, let me just ask you this, Elena. You guys are talking about uh, targeting, you know, a certain threshold of, of user at the beginning, but maybe you can share some of the, the the free security stuff or some of the tools that you guys have released so far or are willing to uh, release in the near future for just the average person so to sort of again mm -hmm. you know, help the whole ecosystem. Uh, raise uh, its security awareness. Yeah, uh, we have we've noticed that a lot of people in the space still, you know, struggle with some very basic security principles that don't even have so much to do with with Bitcoin and crypto, but are like basic uh, uh, security hygiene, let's say. And so recently, we released a free tool, uh, which is a security checklist, or you can call it the security health check. Uh, where you can just go to our website, keys.casa, and there's, let me open that real quick, uh, and there's this uh, button oh, right I'll, there. I'm going to screen share it too for, for, for the, yeah. for the oh, cool. live viewers. Thank <laughs> you. There's a button that says improve your security, and basically you, you create an account that's free of charge. You do your own security health check, and you go through very basic questions, um, and we, we will expand on that tool in the future. So we kind of keep 
uh, the crypto space a little bit more educated and being able to check on on the different you know uh, attack vectors uh, that they're facing so we're asking yeah exactly you can click through a little bit if you want to what you do <laughs> uh, yeah it's uh, everything that you will see from casa coming uh, is a simple click next <laughs> uh, there's just yes and no answers you know questions like do you use a password manager uh, do you have two-factor authentication you can see that so this is something that I'm uh, super excited about because uh, we want to, you know, just open up uh, these these questions and again make it very very simple and and easy for people to go through. Yeah, this is really great. Um, you know, for the for the um, audio listeners, we are screen sharing the the website here at uh, app. Yeah. Keys. Casa, and it's really interesting to be able to get your own report here because they 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 do do a nice walkthrough of everything that you need here. So uh, for those who are uh, want to check this out, definitely go to uh, Casa. What is the website here? Uh, what is keys. Your, casa. Yeah, keys. keys. Casa, that's what it is. And we're yes. at app. Keys. Casa. So yeah, definitely check that out. It's very very helpful, and I, I'm looking forward to more of these types of uh, the, these efforts from the ecosystem itself to help the whole ecosystem. Like, you know, we have the, the Optech newsletter now, right? Uh, I, I really, uh, I know a lot Absolutely. of people that are enjoying that. Yeah, exactly. And so these, these types of efforts, this grassroots is what I really, really like to see uh, us all together, you know, sort of building this new uh, financial system uh, together, uh, an open financial system. So really, really great to hear. Uh, let me see. Uh, what was the next question here? Yeah, so actually, I want to ask Jameson this because this is pretty. This is pretty interesting. So, Jameson, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you've because you've said this in the past. You've said that uh, Casa is more of a, a Bitcoin first company. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Elaborate on that a bit. Yeah. Well, the the thesis is that if Bitcoin fails, then it's likely not going to be good for the rest of the ecosystem. And we also believe that a lot of the innovations are happening in Bitcoin. And, and so, you know, it's been interesting to see some of the other companies in this space um, kind of um, eschew uh, bothering to, to add uh, support for, for latest features and best practices in Bitcoin and, and rather are focused on you know adding as many different crypto assets as possible. They're kind of doing a like a, a spray and pray approach, I guess. Um, like everybody is doing that, by the way. Everybody just focused on adding new assets. That's all they care about. I hate that. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were doing that at BitGo as well. And the the complexity of, of the infrastructure at BitGo uh, grew by orders of magnitude as we were doing that. And it made my life uh, a lot more complicated. And I didn't really... Um, appreciate having to expend a lot of time uh, working on these other things, though uh, it, admittedly I learned a lot about a lot of these other networks um, and and if anything what I learned ended up strengthening my conviction that I believe that like Bitcoin is on the the best technical roadmap if you will of, of being conservative with the changes that it's making. And and so we, we think that like as a, a, a a network that is very narrowly focused on what it's trying to do, uh, that it has a very good chance of continuing to see, to succeed at that as opposed to a number of other networks that are you know, more like kitchen sink protocols and they're just still trying to figure out what they can uh, best facilitate for people. So, um, you know, for us, it's uh, simplicity over complexity, I suppose. Um, and uh, you know that that ends up rearing its head in a number of different ways, uh, but it, it makes life easier for everyone. I think. Absolutely, yeah. I really like that term, Jameson. I'm stealing that now. Uh, kitchen sink protocols. Can we get that hashtag going, people? Uh, hashtag kitchen sink protocols. Uh, no, this is you know this is just what we're seeing in the space. We're seeing just um, that that that. that that's the only way that people can compete against Bitcoin, right? Is asymmetric information is 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 preying on people that, that who don't understand this technology, and all they have to say is we're Bitcoin plus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, and it, and it just kind of gets crazy. So it's really great to see you know companies like yourself understand that that is not the right approach. Understand that because Bitcoin is so focused, the approach that, that a Bitcoin company needs to take is 
focus. This is, uh, I think, what Trezor has taken uh, approach as well, and it shows. So, you know, Trezor is still super, super secure. You know, and, he, and there's and there's people that are passionate about their, that keeping it secure. So there's people in the community that are like constantly trying to hack it, and um, and when they find something, they expose it, and they never think it's fixed. And this is uh, this is what you get when you focus, as opposed to the kitchen sink with something like Ledger that. Man, they support everything. Uh, it's getting really crazy. And so what we what we've seen is that we've seen it be a little bit less secure. Uh, you know, not no knocks to Ledger, but of course, you know, we've seen that they have had uh, issues uh, in 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 keeping that their device but, secure. So but, uh, you know, to be completely fair, uh, Trezor is also releasing a lot of new uh, new crypto. Just today, I saw a list uh, amongst them. Is I think Monero coming, uh, Cardano, and uh, and uh, Lisk, and a few few more. Uh, I think even Ripple. Uh, but but again, uh, those so protocols just, have been just, out for a while, though, right? Like if they're not just adding like new stuff, like exchanges yeah, and, and other things. No, on. no, no, and that's true. And and Trezor has always been Bitcoin first. And at Casa, we we basically have the same the same uh, idea around uh, security. Bitcoin first. If our clients uh, uh, come to us and they say, "Oh, I have a bunch of, you know, Monero, and I have, uh, I don't know, Zcash," we will honor our client because, in the end, it's it's the, the goal is a sovereign and secure individual. That's the vision of Casa. Uh, but saying that, we always be Bitcoin first company. Um, so yeah. And of course, you know, and of course, customers will you know, request additional assets and, and that's yeah. fine and everything. And you want to make sure that, you know, that, that they are taken care of, but of course it's a balanced approach. You guys just don't add it because a couple of people want it. You know, you add it uh, if the protocol has been already tested and sort of in the wild for a while and you have a big enough demand, you know, for it. it's not just one or two people. So l let me uh, ask you this then, uh, Jameson, what, uh, and maybe to Elena, what is the, uh, what, what are some of the new features coming down the line for Casa that, that some that uh, customers who already are, are familiar with Casa can mm -hmm. expect? Yeah, we are uh, expanding towards Ethereum. Uh, we uh, already have, a, let's say, single single SIG Ether support. Uh, we are, how, you know, the multi SIG in Ethereum is kind of a tricky uh, deal. So we, we are kind of waiting and working with the with the Ethereum community on on finding like what is the best protocol for the smart contract by by, by tricky by tricky elena do you mean non-functional or or <laughs> sorry there's, well, there's, I, I have to knock down ethereum multi-sig every time i get a chance to sorry there are several points to the tricky in ethereum <laughs> and uh, it comes like um uh, but basically it's more about there's no um um, consensus, general, con at least the community consensus on uh, a, a smart contract for multi-sig in Ethereum. Of course, I, in the ideal wor world, uh, multi-sig would be native, uh, but I don't know if that's coming. I think th this is something maybe Jameson can elaborate a little bit more. But uh, yeah, this is what we're hoping because to, to introduce in a full, uh, full beauty, uh, just like for Bitcoin. Um, I don't want to actually give up too many more future <laughs> plans. Uh, stay no, tuned. No problem, it, no it's, it's, you guys it's are always definitely... working on something new, I, I would assume. Yes. Uh, yes. And this team is working really fast. And I, I've an unpre unprecedented uh, speed, I would say. Uh, we, we basically released the note in just a few months of work. Uh, with a beautiful interface, you know, and you'll you'll see more news around the note uh, coming as well. But as I said, I, I'll I'll keep you, you know, um, waiting a little. Cool, bit cool, cool. Me. Maybe some kind of integration with Liquid or something like that down the line. You never know. Uh, since they're since the, since they're releasing their full node uh, and, and and stuff lately. Uh, let me ask then, uh, Jameson, the same thing. I'll go ahead and. Uh, uh, comment. What, what are you What are you guys looking at for for new features? And maybe you can comment a little bit about uh, what Elena said on the multisig. Yeah, so, you know, this is all an iterative process. Um, on the Vault side, you know, we are talking with various customers and various developer teams about uh, other popular crypto assets that could potentially be added. Uh, you know, the Ethereum side, uh, I went through that with BitGo with doing a multi-sig smart contract, and it was a real nightmare. So we wanted to get more standardization around multi-sig on Ethereum. 
And thankfully, at the the recent DevCon four, uh, there is an effort towards standardizing and formalizing. I think around the uh, Gnosis, Gnosis. Yeah. Uh, contract. So uh, the main thing is that, like we don't want to put customer funds into a multi-sig contract unless there's like such consensus around it that if it failed that you know Ethereum would uh, basically bail it out. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I am interested in continuing to add more best practice guidance into the Vault product itself. There's a number of things there, uh, of, of like uh, automated health checks and and other types of of guide rails that we could add in uh, to the app to to help basically help the user. Uh, not shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, just thinking about more of the ways that users can accidentally harm themselves through negligence or ignorance or what have you. And then, of course, the Node product is are, are very, very new, and we're we're getting a lot of feedback on that and iterating. And uh, you know, it's this is only version one of the Node product. Very, very yeah, cool. Yeah. It's, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Super, no, it's just an emotional note uh, that it's super exciting to you know to. And one, one thing is to release an app uh, and a service. Uh, it's kind of non-tangible, but when you release a hardware product, it's it's kind of exciting because you see the, your babies, you know, traveling uh, with, with, the, with the mail and, and, and people getting excited over unpacking and unboxing um, and sharing, you know. So it's like it, it threw me back a little bit to the moments when we were sending out treasure wallets and got, you know, getting the first feedback and people, some of them reporting, oh, it's not working, you know, these very early days. So it's kind of a lot of uh, excitement and also anxiety around that, of course, uh, because we want to, you know, everything goes smooth and, and perfectly well. But no, we're, right now we are collecting a lot of feedback. As, as Jameson said, we have a private channel for our uh, first note users uh, where we really basically interact with them and and see what's going on there and we'll be iterating on the node software in the future. Yeah, so forward. I mean the the tricky thing with this device is that we're basically asking the user to run their own server and we want this to be a server that someone can run without having, you know, administrative like Linux experience or networking experience. And so uh, we knew that we were going to run into issues around uh, networking and uh, network security and stuff like that. And so that's one of the reasons why at the moment uh, it is only accessible within your local network. We have plans for ways to be able to open that up in a secure fashion because ultimately we want this to be like your own personal data silo and uh, you know using it for any number of different uh, decentralized apps if you will so that when you're out and about uh, doing things in the real world you can basically phone home to your, your node uh, to, to have it uh, give you a additional level of security because it's been sitting there uh, you know validating all of your information and keeping it safe Yep, very, very cool. Uh, so let me just ask one final then question uh, for uh, either Elena or uh, Jameson. Um, are, are there any other competitors? Do you guys Are you guys seeing any competition coming up with basically like this this idea of multi-sig with sort of um, off-the-shelf uh, key signing devices? Are you guys seeing any, any additional competition coming up for CASA? Elena, maybe? Uh, for, for the note or for the... Uh, uh, for, for CASA. For CASA, the multi -sync. Uh Well, uh, you know, the, there's, uh, first of all, I think there's a big demand uh, uh, coming up, not just from the, you know, uh, Bitcoin OGs and and not just, actually, we, we were quite surprised to see the variety of customers that are coming to CASA. So we have people that have had advanced multi six setups and they've, even studied Glacier Protocol and all, all that kind of stuff. But still, when they, you know, saw uh, CASA offering, they chose to go with CASA. And then we, on the other hand, we have, uh, for example, CASA Node users that uh, have never uh, run the command line and they are super happy, you know, to, to just being able to plug and play. 
Um, um, I would say that, you know, there are some multi-sig uh, solutions that are coming out there, but none of them seem to be the type of multi-sig that we're doing. I'm seeing other solutions where it's like multi-sig for enterprises of like sharing amongst, uh, you know, larger uh, groups of people. And then I've also seen some that are like in this like um, social uh, recovery multi-sig where it's like going out there and instead of you having all of the keys yourself, they're getting distributed amongst like random groups of people. Um, but I haven't seen anything like yeah. us where it's multi-sig, but you have all of the devices yourself. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I, I tried to look around too, like for some type of competition for Casa, but really nobody seems to, to do exactly what you guys want to do, which is not only, of course, give you the best in class security, but still provide the ability 100% to have sovereignty over, you know, your keys and, and your money. So uh, that doesn't seem to be a big uh, focus for other companies, of course, you know, things like Coinbase and, and of course, all the institutional investment stuff, they, they want to hold, they, they want to hold everything. So uh, that is really, really, really interesting to see. Um, Alina, did you want to comment on that too? Uh, you know that the you know there there will be a scale between fully custodian or fully like uh, institutional grade of uh, multi sig services such as BigO provides, and there's definitely market for that. Uh, although I'm of the opinion that even uh, uh, companies, you know, hedge funds, investment funds, family offices, they uh, uh, should probably seek out rather casa type of uh, setup uh, because. All, all the custodian services, and you touched a little bit on that when you mentioned the legacy financial system, you know, as it is like layered and very complex. So all these custodian uh, services have been developed because the, the, the traditional system is, is uh, difficult to secure. Um, so we have specialized companies doing that. In Bitcoin, actually, if we do that, we introduce more risk, right? Um, that's very brutally said. Okay, it has nuances, and then of course you you have very uh, elaborate setup somewhere. But in general, I would always prefer uh, even like small, medium-sized companies uh, that don't need you know high volume trading uh, uh, and and do moves often to just uh, choose a uh, choose type of casa uh, environment because of of uh, eliminating the third party risk. That, that's it. Awesome, yeah. awesome. The, the, those those social those social multi sig apps that that Jameson touched. There are some that are trying to basically use uh, a, a circle of people you trust. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit because that may be uh, that may sound as a good idea, uh, but I, I'm not sure it is. So you know, especially when uh, you know. Uh, a, a life ends. Uh, 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 people change <laughs> sometimes. You know? so, I, I can attest to that. Uh, people definitely change. And generally, of course, there's even been studies where like every 10 years or something, a person is like entirely different. Uh, you see, and so uh, having uh, like the, the having the common knowledge or distributing um, the power uh, unwisely amongst your close circles may not just like uh, have them, you know, try to abuse that uh, situation, but also being them an attack vector. Because uh, if if you know that you know you are using a certain a certain type of setup, uh, then you can potentially, with good social hacking skills, you know, find out who those people are, trying to you know um, kind of get this information and and social hack the the money. I don't know. So. I don't know, Jameson, what you think about this, but there there is a tendency to towards these type of setups. I would be a little bit careful about that. As it well. seems like they're way easy to be social engineered. But go ahead, Jameson. Yeah, well, you know, um, ultimately, you probably don't know what the best practices are that these other people are going to follow, and. And so it's it's more of like the the unknown and lack of control is is where security vulnerabilities can come mm -hmm. into play. So so we we do think that if you're controlling all of your own keys, then you know the exact you know configuration and and you have this additional peace of mind. Whereas 
Um, and you know, I've done this uh, in the past with some of my like cold storage recovery backup stuff for like in case I get hit by a truck. And I have uh, trusted executors and friends and family who have you know pieces of encrypted data. Um, but I've never been able to be fully sure that, you know, they're keeping that data intact and that if something would happen, that they would be able to, uh, A, like remember it and find it and then, uh, you know, be able to come together and reconstitute it. Yeah, to me, it just sounds like it exacerbates all the issues. I mean, just the, the whole social thing. So that, that does not seem uh, wise to me, especially when, you know, it's not like they have a support team around them. Like Jameson says, you don't know what these really what these people set up are. But go ahead, Alina. Yeah, I, I would be uh, way more. I would be actually much more comfortable to to trust uh, a lawyer, for example, you know, uh, because he's a professional. He is uh, liable by by law um he for example your inheritance lawyer right your uh, wealth uh, estate or how do you call it in english um i, I would totally uh, be fine with having such a person uh some access or some data or some information i would I, i'm less also fine with uh, entrusting one of my keys for example to a bank um, a lot of people think that, you know, having a security deposit, uh, like a deposit box in a bank, uh, is a is a smart uh, thing to do. Little they know that uh, in case of any crisis, at least that that comes uh, into play in European Union, uh, the, the, the state can basically uh, take away whatever is in the bank accounts or, and in the, the bank safe deposits that comes to your documents, whatever. So there are, you know, certain, it's it's very difficult to generalize and, and say, okay, this is the role. It's not, you know, uh, but, but, but for sure, we the, the, the idea is not to ever give them more than one key. Like sure, uh, a lawyer, sure, uh, a bank, sure, but only one of my keys will, will they yes. get, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Very interesting. Well, we, I think we had a great discussion, guys. I don't want to keep you too long. I, I usually try to keep these to an hour, so I think we can close it out here. I just want to say really, really, again, uh, appreciate you guys being on here. Just a quick recap. You know, we, we did talk about uh, this new company, Casa, uh, but with Jameson and Elena here. Uh, what they have here is a best-in-class key management system with a 305 multi-sig, and of course, they only ever keep one key just to make sure that it is you still have sovereignty over your own money. They do have a premium service uh, that is available for 10000 a year, and then again, they just released their new uh, Lightning node, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think that's around $300, which will give you uh, access to the Lightning network and the ability to run a Bitcoin full node with just one click, pretty much, you know, what plug and play, right? So that is pretty awesome, guys. I still got to get mine, uh, but uh, that is, uh, I got enough nodes as it is. I don't need any more. But uh, again, just really, really thank you guys for being on. I uh, had a great time. Uh, Elena, where can, maybe you can tell us, where can we find out more about you? About me? About you, Elena. Uh <laughs> okay, uh, just Google. I don't know. Just Google my name. Um, there's uh, some blog uh, about uh, me joining Casa, the medium.com of Casa. Uh, you can go to Twitter and see the crazy stuff I'm tweeting uh, at Alena Satoshi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, everybody follow her. Uh, old school Bitcoiner, guys. Of course, if you don't know, you got to know. You got to find out who she is. She's been involved in Bitcoin for a number of years now. And uh, again, you guys can find uh, the website at keys.casa uh, for that. And then, uh, Jameson, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where we can find out more about you, sir? Uh, well, you can find the compilation of pretty much everything I've ever done in this space on my website. It's lopp.net, lop.net. Yes, and of course we put that. that. <laughs> yeah, we, we we put that in the video description of every one of our videos, lop.net, under more resources. And of course, we also have that website uh, lo uh, linked on cryptocast.network because it is Jameson still to this day one of the the most trusted sites, in my opinion, uh, to find out new information about Bitcoin. So definitely check that out, guys. Lop.net, very very awesome. Thanks again, guys, so much for joining. We really appreciate everybody in the chat. If you guys missed the show, definitely join us in the comments below. Uh, we put out shows like this all the time, guys. Of course, uh, we're gonna have a crypto Q and A show tomorrow and then uh, the bitcoin news show as we do every sunday this was the first show back from a, a bit of a hiatus so really really gl uh really glad to be back and really appreciate everybody for the time so until next time guys just keep talking bitcoin we'll see you later thank you bye